they, they did this experiment in Mount Washington. And this was the idea. Okay, this is a mountain. It's Mount Washington. And they were at the top here, and they shot particles down. The particles that they shot down are called pions. Okay? Pi plus minus. They've got a charge. The plus means positively charged, the minus means negatively charged. Now, if you leave a pion alone, if you just put a pion on a table and you go and get a cup of coffee, when you come back, the pion's gone. You have two photons. So the pion decays into two photons. How long does it take the pion to decay? Does anybody know? It's, it's, it's some small lifetime. I, don't, I, I can't remember exactly what it is now, but it, I, I don't know. Something like 10 to the minus 6 seconds, something like that. So it decays extremely quickly. Okay? So, so these are short-lived particles. Now what happens is, because they live for such a short time, if you take them on the top of the mountain and you shoot them down at the bottom here, there's people at the bottom here that would like to see the pions. So you shoot them down the mountain. Now, the amount of time it will take the pion to travel down the mountain, they would never live that long. So there'll be no pions at the bottom of the mountain, according to Newton. But according to Einstein, when you shoot them down, because the pions are moving, they live for longer, right? And because they live for longer, now they should get to the bottom of the mountain. So when you shoot the pions down, if Newton was right, at the bottom, you would see no pions. If Einstein was right and the clocks on the pions run more slowly, the pions would live for longer and they would be able to get to the bottom. So that's a nice experiment because if you see pions at the bottom of the mountain, this formula for time running more slowly is correct. If you don't see pions at the bottom of the mountain, then Newton was correct and that formula that we wrote was wrong. They shot the pions down and at the bottom of the mountain, they saw pions. So it really means those particles live longer than you would expect because they were moving. Okay? Now, Taboka's question about the long cat. So people didn't phrase it in terms of a long cat. They phrased it in terms of a wormhole. So what a wormhole is, it's meant to be, so space-time has got some dynamical geometry, and it's meant to be this... Um, geometry where one point in space-time is connected to another point in space-time. And then you take one of the sides and you start to move it fast. So now you have, I'm just going to draw a picture. You have one side of a wormhole, another side of a wormhole, and this side of the wormhole you start to move it with some speed. So the clock here runs more slowly than this clock. And uh, so, so, so using this, the kinds of things that you'd be able to do, if you now go into this side of the wormhole, you will come out of that side at a different time. Because if this side was moving, the clock runs more slowly. So you can go into the past, or somebody here could walk that way and get into the future. Okay? So the two sides of the wormhole would be at different times. And that's been calculated and, well, okay. The wormhole itself probably doesn't exist. But if it did, we know that the clocks at the two ends would run differently and this would give you some sort of a, a time machine. So if you did have a long cat, the tail of the cat could be younger than the head of the cat. <laughs> so, you know, that could be good, you know. You've got a face of, I don't know, a 19-year-old. <laughs> but the body of someone who's, I don't know, 60. <laughs> if you could move your head at a very different speed to your body, which you can't. Okay, good. Yeah, but they would age differently. Absolutely. Good. Okay. So that's time dilation. Now, why did all of you think that sounds crazy? Because you've never seen something like that, right? So let's just see what happens. How fast do we usually travel compared to the speed of light? Okay, so...
How fast am I traveling now? About a meter per second, something like that. Let's say we've got a car going at 200 kilometers an hour. That's fast, right? You'll get a big speeding ticket if you do that. How fast are 200 kilometers per hour in meters per second? How fast is it? 200 kilometers per hour. 200 kilometers is how many meters? 200,000. So 200,000 kilometers per hour. Now you need to divide by 3,600 seconds. 55 meters per second. Good. So let's take V is equal to 55 meters per second. Now let's take the square root of 1 minus 55 meters per second. How fast is the speed of light? 3 times 10 to the 8. Okay. And we need to take that squared. Okay. Thomas, have you got a calculator there? Yes. What is that? So this is 3.3 times 10 to the minus 14. So this is 1 minus 3.3 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay. Now I don't think your calculator is going to be able to calculate that. Just try. No, it just tells you it's 1. Okay. Now, who can tell me how big this number is? The calculator can't do it. Come on, guys, this is your chance to prove you're better than a machine. <laughs> What's the square root of 1 minus x if x is small? Uh, okay. <laughs> now you're as good as a machine, now do better. <laughs> 1 minus 1 half x, right? Okay, everyone happy? That's the first order Taylor expansion. So this is approximately equal to 1 minus 1 half of 3.3 is? 1.65, something like that. 1.65 times 10 to the minus 14. That's how small that number is. Okay? How long do you think you're going to live? Come on, be optimistic. You'll live to be 104. Okay? So let's say you'll live to be 104. If we take 104 years, okay, let's think about how much. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 14, let's multiply by 104 years. And that would tell you how much your lifespan would shift. So instead of living for 104 years, you'd live for some other age because you were traveling at... How fast do we say? 200 kilometers an hour. Okay. So if we say 1.65 times 10 to the minus 14 times by 104 years, how many days in a year? Okay. Let's make it. Um, 1.65 times 10 to the minus 14 times 104 years times. How many days in a year? 365. How many hours in a day? 25. Very good answer. How many seconds in an hour? Okay. Thomas, will you do the honors? So let's work out. How much extra time would you live? So instead of living for 104 years, You'd live for 104 plus? So instead of living for 104 years, if you sat in your car your whole time, so when you were just born, they quickly put you in a car. You now travel at 200 kilometers for your whole life. Your clock would tick slightly slower. So you would live a total of 50 microseconds longer. That's how much longer you'd live. These effects that we're talking about are so tiny that you would never ever see them. This 1 minus v over c squared is very, very nearly 1 for anything that we do in our everyday life. There are places where you need to take it into account. For example, when you're studying the electrons moving close to a nucleus, those do move at a speed that's close to the speed of light. And you do need to take that into account there.
But for us in our everyday lives and everything we see, it's such a small effect, we never have to account for it. So for us in our everyday lives, if V over C is really so small, let's see, instead of using the Lorentz transformations, what should we use? Begin. So. So V over C is minute. So we would learn that C times by T prime is equal to. What's the square root going to be replaced by? 1. Because this is so tiny. This is V over C. What's this going to be replaced by? 0. So we'll just get CT. Then we've got X prime equals. What will that square root be replaced by? 1. We've got x plus vt. Then we've got y prime is equal to y. We've got z prime is equal to z. What is that? Galilean. Galilean transformations. So in your everyday life, the transformations that you should use, the ones that you will observe, are the Galilean transformations. Where did the Lorentz transformations come from? Thinking about electromagnetism from Maxwell's equations. Okay. So this was a triumph of thought, of theoretical reasoning. That's how we discovered uh, special relativity, not from any experiment. The effects that we're talking about are minute. Good. Any questions on that, guys? Okay, so when Lorentz derived these transformations, he knew these were the symmetries of Maxwell's equations, but he would never have dreamt of telling you that two clocks run at a different rate. Even when I told you guys the two clocks run at a different rate, you didn't want that, right? So it was Einstein's genius to understand that this is actually what's going on. So the equations had been derived already, and Einstein didn't derive them, but he was the one who correctly interpreted the physics. Actually, it's kind of interesting. When he wrote, I can't remember which colleague he wrote to, but he was describing his paper, and he said, um, it's a minor paper. It has an interesting interpretation of some other results. So Einstein really thought, you know, this is no big deal. He just explained how to think about the theory. But it was really, uh, well, I think it was a very big deal, because he, he was teaching us that time doesn't run at the same rate in these two different frames. That's remarkable. You call uh, the experiment talk of the clock taking on an aircraft's run? Mm -hmm. um, because that's why, because I think it's so now I'm not really convinced that if you start two clocks, or electronic clocks, and you take them around, uh, around the world, you notice a difference between the time. They've seen that. Are you worried that the one guy was messing around with the clock? <laughs> They both start at T as north, the one gets into the plane, flies around the earth, and now they've got a different reading. Yes. You're saying, what's the physics of that? Yes. Okay, why don't you explain to me the physics of why they would read exactly the same value? The same value is like, actually, I'm counting. I think for this process, I'm counting from 1 to 5. One, but why doesn't getting on the plane interfere with that counting? You have to prove to me that it doesn't. You have to have an argument one way or the other. The argument that people had before Einstein, that the times tick at the same rate, is that that was the symmetry of Newton's laws. And they thought Newton's laws was the physics of nature, and those laws look the same in the different frames. Now we know that Maxwell's equations is the correct physics of nature. Okay? Another way to prove it would be to measure light that's, uh, uh, you know, have a stationary source emitting light or move towards the source that's emitting light. And if you measure the same speed of light, the clocks have to run differently. Okay, so let's uh, do one other thing. So do you believe the speed of light is the same in, in different inertial frames? Well, I think that's just an assumption that was here because we can't really know. <laughs> yes, that, that wasn't an assumption. I know, except in the last Last yeah. lecture, you said we took the example of the guy riding in the car, and you said you guys won't see the speed of light. So, but I believe that there is a dimension superior to our understanding, which can be just not because we can't. Sorry, the robot? This dimension superior to our understanding. You, okay, there may be extra dimensions until I can see them in a lab, 
I won't talk about it. <laughs> I don't believe it. If I can see it in the lab, I'll believe it. I just believe that's an assumption for Okay, just well, let me put it like this, okay? In science, we don't talk about believing in one thing or another. We go into the lab and we test it. Now, we have measured light in these different frames. And the speed of light is always a constant. That's a measured fact. Now, you might say, you guys didn't measure accurately enough. Maybe that's true. And maybe in the future we'll detect, in fact, that this is not an exact symmetry of nature. That's possible. And people consider that. And what they do is they analyze the experiment and they try to see with greater and greater accuracy how good is Lorentz invariance. Now, it might be that the world is not really Lorentz invariant. But every single experiment that we've done so far to test Lorentz invariance has taught us that Lorentz invariance is perfect. And we've managed to do some pretty good experiments. Because we can measure protons coming at us from distant places in the universe. And these protons have a huge energy. And for these things, moving with such a high energy, we would expect to see any deviations from special relativity. And special relativity holds perfect. So, so far it's an experimental fact. So, so within what we know so far, the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames. Okay? Can we assume that? So let's, <laughs> let's assume that, and it's supported by experiments. You know, in science you never prove anything, right? You can never prove anything. I mean, you can only say it's consistent with everything that we've seen so far. But if the day comes that you see one thing that disagrees, then you have to throw it away. Science has got high standards. You can't say 300 things agreed and only 299 disagreed. So we'll take it. No. It doesn't matter if 14 million experiments worked. If one doesn't, you have to throw the law away. That's the standard. So we haven't found that one experiment yet that disagrees. So we can keep it. Now, Okay, so I am going to try to convince you in a second way. Okay? Here you have a spacecraft. It has a length L. Okay? And we shoot a beam of light. It goes up to the top of the spacecraft, it hits a mirror, and it comes down again. If we ask how long did it take for the beam to go up and down, we know that the speed of light times by the time that it took has to be equal to 2L, because that's how far the light traveled. Okay? Now, consider the same spacecraft, but now here you are in the spacecraft watching the beam of light. Now you're going to be standing here watching the spacecraft go past. So the beam is emitted over here. By the time it hits the roof of the spacecraft, the spacecraft has moved. Now the spacecraft sits over here. Okay? So the beam of light travels up here and it hits the roof of the spacecraft over there. And by the time the beam of light comes down, now the spacecraft has moved to here. There the beam comes down. Now I use my assumption. The speed of light here is the same as the speed of light there. Okay? So, how far did the light travel? C, T, prime, because I don't know if the times are the same. Um, C, T prime would be equal to what distance did it travel? So the distance that it traveled is that distance plus that distance. So it's two times. Now what is this distance? This length here is L by Pythagoras. And this length over here is Vt, I guess, over 2. Vt prime over 2. Okay. So now we'll use Pythagoras' theorem. To say, uh, we said L squared plus V T prime over 2 squared. 
You happy? Yeah. Good. Now, let's solve for L squared. Okay? In fact, let's solve for, for L squared. So, for L squared will be equal to, from this equation, I will get uh, C squared T prime squared minus T prime squared minus V squared T prime squared. Okay? And from this equation, I will get C squared T squared. Okay? I can now solve to learn that my T prime is T over square root 1 minus T squared over C squared. Same answer. And here it's very explicit. The only thing I assumed was the speed of light was the same in the two frames. So as soon as you've measured that the speed of light is the same in the two frames, the clocks have to run at a different rate. Okay? Well, if you want the laws of physics to be consistent with the fact that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames, then clocks in different frames cannot run at the same rate. The clock must depend on how fast you go. Did you have a question, Pumlani? Oh, is there, is there anything else that gets affected? Absolutely. So things can appear to have a different length. Um, masses of I'm saying, are there any other factors that can slow down time? Oh, are there any other factors that can slow down time? Absolutely. Uh, if you're in a gravitational field and you're close to a very, very massive body, time ticks more slowly. So on Earth, time is ticking more slowly than it is out in space. That has also been measured. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, so, 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 so you might ask, you might say, man, you said this effect was so small, where would we ever use this in our everyday life? This is used in our everyday life. GPS. GPS, very good. So, how does the GPS system work? There's a satellite in the sky, right? So there's two effects here. The satellite is moving, and that satellite is moving fast. So you have to take into account time dilation. But that satellite is way above the Earth. It's far from the Earth, and the Earth is heavy. So the satellite and the clock is ticking differently because of the Earth's gravitational field is weaker up there too. So in that case, both of these reasons why clocks can run differently have to be taken into account. And if you didn't take it into account, quite quickly, I don't remember the exact numbers, but very quickly your GPS would be inaccurate. Okay? So we are already using special relativity and the theory of gravity where clocks slow down and so on, that's called general relativity. That's Einstein's nonlinear theory of gravity. Okay? Um, that also affects time. Good. Okay. So if you want to live longer, <laughs> you need to move. <laughs> Fast. Fast. Add one thing to this. It will look longer to an outside observer. That's right. So in that frame of reference, so they need to be very Speed. Yeah, your life will seem to be the same length, but you know, when you stop moving, you'll look younger than your friends. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Um, right? um, the question is, what is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is a fantastic question, and I can honestly tell you, no one knows. <laughs> that is one of the questions, in fact, that people are asking seriously. In, uh, so, so this year, I had time of teaching. In January, February, March, I was in Durham University. There was a program at the Institute for Advanced Studies, and the topic was time. So there was a bunch of us, and we used to come into work every morning, drink lots of coffee, and talk about time. <laughs> it was great. Okay. So, um, good. Now, okay, I would like you guys to calculate something. Mm -hmm. 
On the top board, you have a formula for CT prime in terms of CT VX over C. So, let's eliminate this. And let's eliminate this. And we will have y prime is y and z prime is z. Using those formulas, I want you guys to calculate what is c t prime squared minus x prime squared minus y prime squared minus z prime squared. Please calculate that now.
Can I simplify that further? If I take out c squared t squared, I'll have 1 minus v squared over c squared. So that first term So what do we notice? If you do this calculation, c t prime squared minus x prime squared minus y prime squared minus z prime squared is equal to c t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. So if you calculate what is c t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared, in any two frames, you will get the same answer. This quantity in the frame with no primes is equal to the same quantity in the prime frame. This is something that doesn't change when we go from the t, x, y, z coordinates to the t prime, x prime, y prime, z prime coordinates. So something that doesn't change when we move from the frame that's at rest to the frame that was moving. Everyone happy with that? Good. Okay, we've just hit four. Let's take a 10-minute break to stretch our legs. <laughs>